I was very lucky to make history for my country and become Scotland's first female world champion in 2019. In my mind, if you want to be the best at something, you better fight the best. Why would you give up if you failed the first time? Try again, try again, and try again, and you'll eventually get there. Have the belief that you can truly achieve what you want to achieve. I'm absolutely buzzing to see where women's boxing is right now, and it's an amazing time to be at the forefront of the change. Like, when I'm a lot older, I'm sitting in a rocking chair, wherever I'll be like, I was at the forefront of that moment when it was changing for women's boxing, you know, in our sport. The first world champion female boxer from Scotland is none other than Hannah Rankin. She shares with me her boxing journey so far, fighting the likes of Carissa Shields and also Savannah Marshall. During her career, her mum sadly passed away from cancer and Hannah shares with me how she overcame this adversity and pushes forward. Be happy, never content and enjoy this episode and make sure you subscribe. Right, welcome back to my podcast, the Stephen Sully Study. I've got a great guest in front of me. In actual fact, I think you are the first female world champion I've ever had on this podcast. So nice one and thank you for your time, Hannah. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's going to be good fun. Yeah. So on that, on that subject, actually, when I was researching, because I didn't actually realise this about you, but you're actually the first female world champion from Scotland. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I was very lucky to make history for my country. Um, and become Scotland's first female world champion in 2019, which was pretty epic. Now, this might sound like a very, very obvious question, but how does it feel to have that accolade that you are the first female world champion from Scotland? I mean, what an achievement. I mean, it's pretty amazing, actually, because, you know, like suddenly you, you've written something into the history books and nobody else can do it before you. You've done it. You're the only person that could have done it. And uh, my dad liked to bring back dad to earth and he was like, well, Hannah, at least you're going to be the answer to a pub quiz question. And I was like, that's what I was aiming for, dad. <laughs> that was my answer. So, yeah, you know, um, but pretty mad. And when I think about it, it kind of blows my mind a bit, to be honest. It's incredible. It's incredible stuff. I'm going to talk, talk obviously about your, your fighting record, obviously what you've been up to recently, etc. cetera. Um, when I was researching as well, you got a bit of a George Groves type um, scenario as far as becoming world champion I know it took him four attempts it took you three attempts so that will to win that determination how did you get that installed into you as an individual because obviously boxing gives you that but yeah. there must have been some of that naturally in you when you was a young girl yeah definitely I, I think to be honest I've always been very naturally competitive with myself and I have two younger sisters. We're all competitive with each other that like you don't want to be playing a board game or cards in our house. It is seriously competitive. Um, but you know, I think that's a, a natural thing instinct in me. And if I'm going to be doing like anything that I choose to, to work at, if I have a passion for it and I enjoy it, then I'm going to give it a million percent and I want to be the best that I can be at it. And that was the thing with boxing. When I started, I didn't start, I always say this to people, I didn't start to be Mayweather, like 50, you know, I didn't start to do that. I started to see how far I could go. So for me, there was never ever any sort of like thought process of, oh, I've lost a fight, I must give up. That doesn't work in my mind. You know, why, why would you give up if you failed the first time? Try again, try again, and try again, and you'll eventually get there. And I'm very lucky to have a great team around me that enable me to do this. And also, I think you have to be quite a resilient person. You have to be able to deal with having the losses, the failures, but able to take it on board and be able to learn from it and come back as a stronger person. Like it's not always easy. Like, you know, that makes it sound quite simple, but it's not simple. You have to do a lot of mental work on it and also have the belief that you can truly achieve what you want to achieve. On that note of mental work, I had a podcast guest on recently who's definitely a friend of yours and, and a mentor, a guy called Robert Hiasi. So shout out to him. Yep. Um, how important is the mindset of being an athlete and what contribution has Rob made towards that in regards to preparing for a fight, winning a fight, or even sometimes overcoming that adversity? Uh, he's a massive, massive part of my team. You know, it's something that I've really learned a lot more about is the mental side of things. It's something that he introduced me to this idea of you have to work on your mind as much as you work on the physical side because I, I give everything 100% in the gym. You know, I'm usually having to get kicked out of the gym by my coach because I'm, I'm working really hard and I know how to practice. You know, being a musician, I know how to put the hours in and how to put the time in. You know, so for me, that side of it, the dedication, discipline, practice, all of that I can do. So when I met Rob, he was like, the same thing applies to your mind. So the things, the same things you did with the visualization for preparing for performances, 
businesses and things like that, you know, that is important because like you have to work at these things. They don't just happen. And I actually do as much sort of exercise with my mind as I now do with my body as well. And that was a huge turning point in my career. And he's been there for me becoming world champion, a two times world champion. Um, he's been there for me successfully defending it. He's, yeah, massive, massive part of my camp. So um, we're here in uh, Woodbury House, our private art studio in Soho. And obviously you, you're down here quite frequently, but life didn't start in London for you. It started in, in Scotland. Yeah. And reading here that you started on your family farm in, do you pronounce it Luss? Luss. Luss, okay, in Scotland. Um, how did you go from a farm <laughs> there in Scotland to where you are now? Where are you actually residing right now? Hannah? So I'm up near Baker Street uh, okay. in London and I've been in London now, well, I think it's about 11, 11 years now, Okay. Uh, which is it's mad when I think about that. That's 11 years here. So um, yeah, no, I came down here because, well, actually I'll, I'll go back. When I was 10 years old, I visited London for the very first time. And obviously growing up on a sheep farm in Scotland in the middle of nowhere, you know, London was huge to me i'd never seen this many people i'd never been in such a busy environment it was incredible and my grandparents brought me down and it was like a, a, a week holiday down here but i decided at 10 years old i want to live here i love the hustle the bustle i love the people i love the buzz the constant energy like everything's always happening there's something happening around every single corner and it just gave me such like as a 10 year old i was just like this is the place i want to be now, I'm completely different to my two younger sisters who both now work in farming. They both live in sort of more remote areas, you know, but for me, I was like, I want to be here, you know, I want to be around people. And um, so at 10 years old, I decided that. <laughs> and then like my whole life sort of started and I went in to do my music, did my undergraduate in Glasgow. Um, and when I was doing all my auditions for my undergraduate slots, I got, I would obviously auditioned in London and um, I actually got a place down in London at that time. And... I had a really good teacher in Scotland and I chose to stay in Scotland because I started the bassoon late. So I chose to stay in Scotland with my teacher who I knew and I actually had a great relationship with. Also in Scotland, and my undergraduate was paid for by the government there. So that was the reason I decided to stay, but it was the second, it was the first time I decided I won't move to London just yet. And then when I got to my master's, I said, I promised myself, now is the time to be in London. Now you're going to move down. And so I did all my auditions down here and I got into the Royal Academy of Music and that was my starting point of moving to London. But that was probably 10 years after being the 10 year old I was at the time deciding this, this is where I want to be. So I've always had sort of big ambitions and big dreams. And that was one of the ones I managed to tick off. So almost running parallel to your love for contact sports. I got here at nine years of age, he was actually taking up Taekwondo yeah. and there was probably other sports in, in, in amongst, you know, uh, at school and at that age, because yeah. we all try things when we're younger. Yeah. But then alongside of that, you were you had a passion for music. So playing the flute at the start mm -hmm. and then onto the uh, uh, bassoon, is that right? Um, I had to look up what a bassoon is because I wasn't actually too sure. I was. Most people I, don't know what it is. I, I, I had a vision in my head and I thought, is that it? Is that it? And then uh, I looked out. So, okay. So, I I can resonate being a you know being being a being a guy and and doing a lot of contact sports because I used to love rugby. I used yeah. to love football. I used to love even playing hockey. Um, and then obviously doing uh, boxing, etc. I used to play squash for England as well. I'm getting champion and That's stuff. That's pretty so, cool. So I was quite, quite, yeah. very, very. But music for me, I, I had one little go of the recorder and I was like, this ain't for me. So The recorder smashes dreams. Is, <laughs> is the most depressing instrument in the world. <laughs> so what, what, how, did, how did that kind of link between sport and then music? How did they kind of synergize together for you? So... As a child, obviously, it was full of energy. I was a total tomboy as well. So, but all me and my two sisters, we were all the same, like working on the farm, playing around. Like, we just had free reign to run amok, basically. And when we were kids, we always used to be fighting with each other. And that's why I ended up doing taekwondo, because I think mum wanted us out of the house from fighting each other and fighting officially <laughs> with somebody else watching over us. Um, but, you know, like music was always a part of our household. You know, one of my earliest memories is sitting on my mum's knee at the piano, you know, and my granddad was a music teacher so it was just always naturally in the house and we were all encouraged to play instruments we were always singing there was there was a lot of stuff involved and um my dad always used to laugh he's like it's like having the von trapp family because he wasn't he wasn't that musical but all of the rest of us were um but for me with 
with the connection between sport and music is that sort of um ability to work at the sort of top range and like that real co- competition with yourself um because physically in sport it's a competition with your body isn't it it's like you know mentally pushing yourself and trying to achieve things but in music it's also a competition to see you know you're trying to create an emotion from somebody else who's listening to you you're trying to you know entertain people and it, it's it is a competition and I think that's that's a connection for me and also the discipline in the two of them both require you to practice things both require you to turn up on time both require you to make sure that you're at a certain level to be able to achieve what you need to achieve so I, I like that sort of discipline and like structure it works really well for me but music is a chance to kind of yeah really uh I, I was always told I wear my heart on my sleeve and that's what, that's exactly what comes out of my music. You know, whenever I perform, you truly see a part of me. And I think I, I get to showcase that in boxing, actually. It's something that I've really connected with later on. I get to showcase who I really am, a little bit of me. And uh, that's why the two connect together. But yeah. I think a lot of people think, when I say I, I do boxing and music, they're like, those two things make no sense. <laughs> but rhythm is involved in both of them and, and timing. So when I first started out, my coach used to say, okay, put that combination to a rhythm in your head when I couldn't really figure out what he meant by putting the power here and that there. So then I used to put it to a rhythm. So, you know, they they worked really well for me. And it's a chance to just get out there and perform under the lights, which I enjoy. I um, I was actually going to say, but you beat me to it. Joe Kawasaki, undefeated world champion yeah. from, from Wales, very, very successful fighter and had some really iconic Legend. fights. Yeah. His dad wasn't traditionally from the fight world, but his dad was actually in music. And he when I watched the documentary, his dad... I think it was Italian originally, wasn't he? Um, used to uh, play a, a beat and Joe Kawasaki had to put a combination together. And that's why he was quite known for his flurry of punches because it was down to the to the music. And when I train uh, down boxing booth and you spar, you have the music on in the background actually quite loud because that's that gets you to move. Yeah. Um, you can almost faint, faint against the, 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 the beat to the music. Yeah. And, and when it's intensified, that's kind of like when you can start sparring, etc. And I think there's a lot of same mindset synergies and, and rhythms behind fighting and, and, and music they do and dancing. It in Thai as well, don't they? They have that regular yeah. that music that plays over and over again. Like like the, yeah, the beat stuff, and it's, it's kind of like it's almost hypnotic, you know, the way that it goes. And music and sport actually do have a, a whole lot of things in common but I think when you think of like the, the sort of the violence of boxing and then like the idea of me sitting in an orchestra doing classical music maybe playing some Mozart people can't really relate those two things together but for me they make perfect sense the um so t- tell me about the reason why you went from flute to bassoon because um I know what the flute is and <laughs> it's actually a really beautiful thing when you hear someone who completely nails it play- playing it but bassoon, what, 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 why, why that transition into playing that instrument? So I was working on my grade eight on the flute and I was one of like, I don't know, 20, 30 people in the school that were playing flute. And uh, a really lovely lady donated a bassoon to my secondary school. Now I went to Hermitage Academy, it's just a state school in Scotland. And, but we had a very successful music department. It was just, it was run by Mr. Pullen and he was very enthusiastic he was very driven to make us a successful department and we always had amazing performances and stuff but our orchestra didn't have a bassoon right so we had oboes we had flutes we had clarinets but we didn't have a bassoon and this lady thought it was terrible that we didn't have one so she donated one to the school now there was a a memo that went out and everyone was asked right we have a bassoon would anybody be interested in taking it up most people like what is that (laughs) um but you know, when I saw it, I was like, that is cool. What is that? And I, it was like something really quirky, really odd, really weird. And I was like, you know what? I'm fed up of being one of 30, 40 flute players. I want to play that thing. And I've always been like that. I've always wanted to go down the little, the different route, do something a little bit different, be, be a bit different. And when I picked it up and I, and I got, got to grips with it, I actually fell in love with it straight away and I knew it was the instrument for me. I just knew. And I always say this to people, it doesn't matter whether you think you're completely non-musical, there is always something out there that is an instrument or like your voice or something that is for you when it comes to music. You just haven't found it yet. So being at the Royal Academy of Music in London, yeah. um, you're, you're clearly good at the, you know, at music and playing, playing the instrument. Yeah. There must have been a crossroads moment where you thought, 
I can either go down this boxing route, being being a sports person, or I could just maintain being being a musician. You know, Um, one of them would have been a lot more safer. I know that, Uh, (laughs) but one of them probably wouldn't have been as much uh, as dramatic and as probably as exciting. So, why did you choose boxing over your music? Well. Firstly, I still do my music. I am a, I still have a quintet. We play in schools and we do work in care homes and things, okay. uh, working with uh, people living with Alzheimer's and dementia. And music is always going to be my first love. It is that thing that I first had that kind of burning desire, the passion to be great at. I, I loved it. It was just what I thought about all of the time. So it will always be there as the first thing. And I think the good thing about music is something you can have it your whole life. It's not got a time delay on it like boxing. You know, you can't box your whole life. You, you Whereas you can, you can be involved in music your whole life. Um, so, but I think actually it was a, a situation like in my life, which was a, a traumatic situation that actually helped me uh, go into boxing as a, as a career path. Um, unfortunately, when I moved to London to start my masters, I was in my first term of masters, and I was doing my boxing, I was getting involved in that there. And then I got home that Christmas, and my mom got diagnosed with cancer, and it was completely out of the blue, a complete shock. No, like there was no forewarning about it whatsoever. And she made me go back to uni because she was so proud that I got into the academy. I was the only one that year that got accepted for the master's position on bassoon. So, you know, she was really, really proud of me going. And she's like, you're not staying at home here with me whilst I'm sick. You're going to go down. So I had to go back to uni. And boxing became that sort of safe haven for me. Like that bit which wasn't associated with my mom because my mom was my biggest supporter. She came to all my concerts. She was always there. So to get away from that sort of connection, boxing became my little home. You know, I had a family in the gym or somewhere different. And I always say this is that it was a one place I could actually be so tired for a split second. I wasn't thinking about the fact that my mom was really ill. And, and unfortunately she passed away six months after that diagnosis. Um, and I think boxing became sort of like a, a bit of a savior for me at that time. I, I needed something that was not associated to what my other love was and uh, with my mom. And my mom never saw me box. She never saw me um, train it or didn't knew I was doing any of it. So it's something that's not kind of connected to her. But I know having her been at all my Taekwondo competitions when I was younger, she'd be the first person shouting for me at the side of the ring. She'd be so proud to see where I am now. But I think that was the reason that I found a passion for something different and it's why I put so much into it because it was there for me in one of my darkest times. And that's probably why I ended up pushing more down the boxing route now um, and just basically seeing how much I can give to it. Yeah. Um, I resonate when you say boxing has been a lifesaver for so many. I mean, look, the the clear ones are people like Tyson Fury. He's admitted it so many times when he become world champion then fell off, become drink, drugs, self-harm, abuse, et cetera, and then bounced back and now he's become a world champion again, heavyweight yeah. world champion. And there are, there's them stories and then there's the stories that you don't really see in the media, but when you go to boxing clubs or to go to communities, you, you hear it from the kids themselves. I mean, I've seen so many kids from basically the streets that could have gone into drugs, could have gone into gangs, could yeah. have gone into violence or doing something wrong with the wrong group and they found boxing and now they've got a family like Phil, which is yeah. so important. Um, funny you mentioned about the whole cancer thing. I was only talking to the people here at, at Woodbury that I don't know whether it's because it's social media and you hear more stories now mm-hmm. or where I'm getting older and, and actually as you get older, friends, family, they start getting diseases and some of them are is the cancers. Things, yeah. Or actually more and more people because of maybe pollution or the wrong yeah. kind of food, people getting it, or it might be a mixture of all three, I don't know. But every time I hear about it, it's like, it just makes you realize that life isn't going to be forever and you are no. you are human. So just, if you don't mind talking about it, bringing it back to that moment, Hannah, when your mum was diagnosed with cancer and she told you, do you know where you were and how you received that information? I was at home um, and we just had Christmas and my nan was there because my mum wasn't well and she'd not been feeling very well. I hadn't really registered how unwell she was because she she would never tell me anything you know when I was studying she just wanted me to be focused on what I was doing you know so um same thing with my my sister was in Australia both my sisters were in Australia so I was the only one here in the UK and they both were flown 
back home a couple of months later when things started to get a lot worse. And But I was at home and I remember the diagnosis coming through and I remember just being like, this can't be happening. Because it's like, you hear about it. You hear about friends and family and, and other people that you know uh, being diagnosed with cancer. But until it becomes something that happens to you and it's right in your family, immediate family, you're like, oh, that it's a reality. It's like you're aware of something and like, you know, you know, people get sick from this and that happens there and these things happen. But it's like that thing that could, it could never happen to us. It could never happen to me. <laughs> and like then now it's happened to my mom. And it was just one of those things where I was just like, my time stopped because then I was like, in my mind, I was like, how do we fix it? How do we, how do we fix the problem? That's immediately how my, my, my mind went. And I was just like, this has to be fixable. And in, it wasn't that sort of thought of what happens if it doesn't work out. It was like, we're going to fix it. We'll make it better. Everything will be fine. And I think throughout that six month period, I was probably the last person. I, I couldn't take it in that when, when she was dying and they, they couldn't fix the problem and she was, she was dying effectively. To me, there was always going to be some way that that was going to be fixed. And when she actually died, it was it was almost like my world stopped because my true my belief in something being fixed that I could always fix the problem suddenly wasn't true, and I I couldn't I couldn't make it any better, you know. So it's it's one of those things where you learn a lot about yourself in in a scenario like that. But at the time, time stood still, and I wasn't aware of anything around me. We were just going from day to day day to day and she wouldn't let me come and stay with her she was like and then when she got really sick and she we moved down to my grandparents house in Norfolk and she was there with my grandparents her mum and dad and we all moved there my dad my sisters everybody we moved down to like stay at a local uh, sort of I think we were staying at a local sort of pub area because my grandparents obviously had my mum at the house and the nurses and doctors and things so it was a, a really difficult time in my life where it's time stood still and you, you're constantly in your mind, how can I fix this? How can I make it work? How can I, because I've always been, I'm a fixer. I like to do things and if there's a problem, I will go out and fix that problem. But it was a a, a reality when, when she actually, when she died that morning and I was just like, why couldn't I fix it? And it's what it, it's one of those things which will always haunt me. And it, it's not my fault. You know, it's not one of those things that I could um, change. But yeah, from that, it's probably why whenever I work hard at anything else, I know like tomorrow is never promised as a person. So it's why I put so much into whatever I do, like be it my charity work or my boxing or my music or whatever it is I'm doing, I put everything into it because I know that, yeah, you might not be here in a few months time. So you might as well make it count. And it, it gives me a different sort of way of looking at things. I like to go all or nothing because you're only here once. So you might as well. The, um, again, like there's so many, like your, your language and the way you talk, there's a lot of things that resonate with me. And I think we both got the same thing in boxing. You could be down on the cards. Yeah. You could be up against the ropes. You could be being beaten the shit out of basically. And then suddenly you pull out a punch from God or somewhere. Yeah and you just completely annihilate the person. And we've seen it time and time again with different fights. And you might have even done it in sparring or you might not be feeling so great. And then suddenly you get this new lease of life and you and you just turn things around. And that happens in business, that happens in sales, that happens in boxing, that can happen in life. And I think as boxers, we've always got that optimistic view that I've got a chance here to turn this around. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what you're faced with, whether it's faced with cancer mm -hmm. or uh you're losing a world title fight or whatever you feel that there is a chance there's always and it, something and, and and you take on that responsibility of there is a chance i know there's a chance so therefore I've, gotta find I've, it. I've got to find the chance <laughs> yeah i know it's going to be pretty much a hard question for you to answer but like when like i would have been the same as you right there's cancer mm -hmm. definitely going to find, find it it's just a matter of time the moment you realized that it was terminal and there was no going back from it, what was that feeling like for you? I still, I didn't believe it. 
So like when, you know, when mum was just, she was just steadily getting worse and the chemo wasn't working and all that sort of stuff. Like in my mind, there was, there was always that little tiny bit of hope that there was a way of fixing it, that, that she would be one of these people that we could turn it around, you know, like, I think when it, when it's your mum, you, you, you just think your mum's invincible, don't you? You just, you think that that she'll always be fine because it's your mum and that, that's the person who's been your hero as a kid done everything for you and shown you everything so in my mind I was just like there's a way around this but on the other side of things it was just like I was watching someone who my mum was always super active obviously she ran the farm with my dad so she she worked on the farm too had uh, she was a hill farmer with my dad um, she, you know, looked after us three girls. We took us everywhere. She ate healthily. She didn't smoke. She didn't drink heavily to excess. She was just super fit, you know, like, and that's one of those things that really, really frustrated me is because like she never abused her body in any way or didn't look after herself, but yet she still managed, this still managed to happen to her. And it was like that unfairness feeling, like that feeling of just like, why, why her? Because she's not done anything that, could warrant her justifiably getting cancer that used to frustrate the hell out of me and it's just like some things you you never understand and that is one of them for me that is, will always be but when I when I was watching her slowly sort of get more sick and, and start to like fade and it, it was like watching someone who my mom was a very active person and then suddenly she was bedridden and she couldn't do things on her own and she was a very independent lady like she had me when she was 21 moved up to scotland took over a farm with my dad where she knew nobody <laughs> so like my mom is where i've got my inspiration and my sort of i think probably my character and my independence from because she was always like that so watching her suddenly have to have someone help her do everything and like not be able to get out of her, of her bed and then start to physically change, lose like strength and, and all that sort of stuff. It was horrible. That was horrible to watch because, and there was nothing you could do. It was like the inevitability of it. And I was still hoping that something was going to happen. There was going to be some sort of miracle. Something was going to happen and she'd be able to turn it around and she'd just be the same again. So in some ways I would never change that about myself no matter what difficult situation I'm in even if like if I'm losing a fight and I've got to create a miracle to make it happen to win I will still always try to win and even if I don't win I still have that that feeling that I've got to do it to make it to fix the problem um and that drive I never ever changed that but then also the hardest part for me was accepting it when she did die because in my mind that was never going to happen so it, it in one way, it's, it's it's so it's a useful part of my character. Like I will not let things go. I will always pursue it. I will always push myself to try and achieve what I know I can achieve. But then on the other hand, when something doesn't work out that I truly believed was going to work out, that's harder to deal with for me because I really truly believed it, it would work out. It's a paradox and it's a bit of a blessing and a curse. I yeah. know exactly what it is. Yeah. It's like... The reason why you're a success is because of the optimism and you'll find the opportunity when others will give up. Yeah. It's like in sales. They say people say no 5, 10, 15 times before they end up saying yes. And that yes can turn into a sale, which can lead on to really good things. You've got a yeah. new client, you know, money, etc. A lot of people give up at the first one or two no's and only a professional professional, relentless salesperson will keep on going and convert it into a yes. But then there is the other side of it is... If you keep on pushing, actually, you're going to do more damage than good. And you've got to know sometimes fine line. When, when to actually pull back and, and, yeah. and be, I don't want to use the word realistic, but kind of be true to yourself. Say, this ain't working and, yeah. and I've got to come to, to terms with it. And I don't think anyone, especially fighters, I don't think you'll ever be able to work that out ever. No. I think it's a continu <laughs> continuous, you know, pursuit of trying to work out what that balance is and what that final line is i'm never going to work out because i'm always an optimist i'm i'm a believer that i could jump out an airplane with no parachute and survive i don't know how i'm with you <laughs> i'm so with you on that yeah. one yeah i don't know how but i'll work it, out a plan on happen, the way down yeah. you know um can you on this last se segment because you know i've never spoke to someone who's lost you know a mum to to cancer like do you remember the last few days or last few things that you 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 and her said together 
it was very it was very difficult because she wasn't really able to talk much at the end so it was that sort of thing where you're talking to her but she's not really responding that much and and i think a lot of the drugs that she had to take and things kind of skewed her view on stuff you know it skewed her her sort of the way that she remembered things like the how she looked at things so it was very difficult but she was always um so i got <laughs> weirdly at the time i at the academy i was asked to go and do a project i actually got the place to go and do a project uh in the north of india the himalayas um doing music with kids in schools up there and helping build some musical instruments for them i actually i i got accepted to do it and i, I won the place <laughs> and i remember my mom talking to me about it and she's like whatever happens you promise me you go because i am so proud that you got this opportunity and I was like, I remember just being like, yeah, yeah, no, that it's not important right now, mom, you know, but like, she's like, no, 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 you promise me you go. And I had like, so when she passed away, that was like in June time, I had to go to, to India in August. <laughs> and it was like, you can probably tell by now I'm quite an independent person, right? So right from like a young age, I was telling my parents, I want to go to boarding school. I want to go and like go to this place. I want to go to this. I was never, ever homesick, never homesick because, and I don't know if that's because I had such a strong like relationship with my parents. And I love my home that whenever I went away, I wasn't, I didn't miss it. I knew I was coming back to it. It was like that, that, that feeling. So I was never homesick. I never missed things like that. And I love to travel, go to different places. But this is the first time in my life I was in a place and I just wanted to be at home with my family. And I, I'd i never felt that before. I'd never felt that like desperate feeling to be home with, with my dad, my sisters, everybody. But ironically, I look back on it now and my trip to India was probably the best thing that could have happened to me because I had no contact to anybody because we didn't have like, it, the internet went out for like days at a time. <laughs> and there was like, no, I didn't have a phone. And it was like, I had one way of phoning them one, like once every like three weeks or whatever. So I was gone and I was in a completely different place, but spent a lot of time on a moped traveling around. I used to talk to my mom in my helmet. So I had my helmet on, I used to drive around and chat to her, but it was a very spiritual place. Cause we spent a lot of time in like the, the Buddhist temples and things like that. And, you know, I grieved at that time. I was still doing my job and everything, but I was grieving, you know, and I was spending time kind of trying to come to terms with the fact that my mom was dead. And um, it was, it gave me not a peace, but like a kind of a acceptance of what I was going back to having spent time there. And at the time it was the worst thing in the world because I, I just wanted to be at home. But now looking back on it, it was one of the best things that happened. And we actually had the, an amazing experience where the Dalai Lama came to that part of India and everybody flocked to that part of India and we got to hear him speak. And that is the meaning of a holy person, you know? And at the time and what I was going through at the time, it, it, was, it was just like the perfect timing for me. But, you know, yeah, I remember her saying, you promised me you go. And so I went. <laughs> so just learning a little bit about you and your, your mum's relationship there and, and even her saying that she's clearly had like certain um a mindset and morals and ethics as, you know she's saying you you've got to go like she was very very determined for you to achieve something in your life so I'm wondering and it's probably going to be an obvious thing but when you became world champion the first female world champion from Scotland in 2019 your third shot IBO super welterweight title against Sarah Coronan. Yeah, Coronan, yeah. I think, yeah. That's it. Can you imagine, can you visualize, can you hear what your mum would have said to you, her little girl winning the world title? She she would have been ecstatic. I think the the only thing that I would have had to worry about with my mum is her not getting in the bloody ring. Like, that's like my, when I was younger, um, we had a taekwondo competition and my dad and my mum came to watch me and my sister compete. And I was competing up for the, it was between the gold and the silver, uh, you know, in the sparring. And I got, I took a big shot <laughs> and my dad had to hold my mum back because she was like, oh yeah, because it was me, I was versus a boy, you know, in taekwondo, it's, it's height and size arranged when you're kids, you know. <laughs> she was like trying to get involved and I always think about that but whenever I walk out for a title fight or for any fight really um and before every fight I have a routine I talk to my mum I go and find a local church or I find a quiet place and I sit down I chat to her and I know when I walk out on fight night it might just be me walking out there but she's right beside me 
So I think when I won it, I think she would have said, <laughs> you're, you're batshit mental, but I knew you'd do it. So, yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, okay. So talking about your fights then, 18 fights, 12 wins. Yep. Um, interestingly enough, this weekend, and sadly this podcast is going to come out after the fight, which I'm slightly <laughs> gutted about, but this weekend coming up, you've got Carissa Shields against uh, Savannah Marshall, who you've actually yep. fought both of these yep. individuals. Um, I want to talk about that, but I also want to talk about the, the pursuit to become a world champion. So I know you had your first world title shot. I think it was 2018, am I right? Yeah. So uh, you was against uh, Alicia Napoleon. Um, tell me about that flight, because that was a split decision, wasn't it? One yeah. judge had it to you yeah. and the other two had it to her. I mean, did you feel that you won it or did you feel you'd done enough or maybe not as well as you predicted? Well, when I look back on that fight, um, it was, I took a shot to go up to super middle. I'm not a super middleweight in any way, shape or form, super middleweight, but then Alicia Napoleon was a small super middle. So I was like, you know what? This is a great opportunity to go and test myself against one of the top girls. I don't know what I would have done if I'd become super middleweight world champion. Like it's crazy when you think what would have happened had that actually happened. But anyway, um, I went to America for the first time and you know, I was getting to fight in America. I was on the, on the stage. We were meant to be on Fox Sports. So it's meant to be on TV, this one. And there's a reason this fight got dubbed the best fight you never saw because Fox Sport turned the cameras off for our fight. And this is like kind of a good point to make that, you know, we have this amazing women's, all women's card this weekend. It's shown live on Sky Sports. It's a massive, massive event. It shows you how far we've come to, oh, it's the women's fight, so we're not going to show it. Um, and it was an epic fight. Me and me and Alicia, you know, there was a point in the seventh round, I think I had her on the ropes and then the bell went, you know, it was a, it was a really good fight. And I don't think I did enough to win, but I think it was a fantastic fight. And, um, I actually tore my bicep in that fight, but I didn't realize until the next day, um, why I wasn't able to throw my jab. Uh, but I, like my corner say, throw your jab more. I was like, I I am throwing my jab, but I wasn't. Um, but, you know, it was the first time I'd taken myself out of the UK to fight in, in America. And it was giving myself an option to be seen by American audiences. Um, and it was probably one of the best things I ever did because for my profile, it shot my profile through the roof. Um, and it meant that I had connections over in America now. I've been over there and I was suddenly a name in the boxing world that was coming up and not just this crazy girl doing a bit of boxing. You know, I come in and I thought, you know what, I'll take this shot. And because the fight was quite close, but nobody, he never got to see it, but all of the media that reported on it, yeah, the best fight you never saw. So it was a great experience for me and it helped propel my career massively forward. And then another big learning curve for you um, was against Carissa Shields. Now, sadly, uh, I think all the judges gave it to her, but you no, was yeah. basically in her backyard. And it was for the WBA, IBF and WBC. One of them, I think, was vacant as well at the time. Mm. This is your second second world title shot. Um, fighting Carissa Shields. <laughs> one, what was she like actually in the ring? But mm -hmm. two, what was she like building up to the fight? Because if I'm... Being honest, what I see about her, which I love, and also sometimes you can get quite quite frustrated with, as a supporter with you know one of our home English girls about to fight her, is she's quite gobby. You know, oh, yeah. she's uh, she's she's got she's got good lyrics. She knows how to rev the crowd up. She knows how to piss off her opponent. What was that like fighting her and? promoting the fight with her well yeah she definitely won that fight you know i i was in there against somebody who's got two olympic gold medals multiple world championship titles you know and the reason that i end up fighting her is because nobody else wanted to fight her um <laughs> at the time everyone was uh, she was meant to fight christina hamer who i've been sparring i was sparring partner for christina hamer over in germany and that, that was meant to be a big fight which happened later but nobody wanted to fight her it was kind of a good story and someone said oh would you do it and Noel came to me, my coach, he said, we've been off with the Clarissa Shields fight. <laughs> At which point I sat back down on the ring and I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> um, and I remember being asked it, I was like, brilliant. Because in my mind, if you want to be the best at something, you better fight the best. And the same in music, if you want to be the best, you've got to work with the best, you've got to learn from the best. So I was like, I'll do it, right? And we naturally didn't like each other. And, and 
that it was immediately di- like we thought we had nothing in common you know i come from the middle of nowhere in scotland on a farm started boxing late came didn't have any amateur experience up against someone who's from flint michigan one of the roughest parts of the of the u.s um two olympic gold medals completely different story and like we, we thought we had nothing in common she's like i'm gonna knock you out in four rounds i was like you never knocked anybody out you know and i was just like this is and then that's how it started you know and i was just but i was just speaking facts you know, and things, and this is how the whole social media side of it all blew up. And there's a lot of trash talking forwards and backwards. And it was the first time I'd really experienced the big stage. It was, this was the big stage. It was on Matrim, it was on DAZN, it was beamed globally around the world. I got flown to New York for 24 hours. It was incredible for a press conference. I'd never done anything crazy like this. The the suite I had in New York was bigger than my flat in London. (laughs) And it was just mine and my coach had one as well. Um, You know, like that whole experience is like, now you're in the big leagues, You you know? And that was when I learned a lot about myself because I had to speak in front of, in the cameras for the press conferences. Then I had like, you know, the, the fight week press conference where she's having to go at me. I'm sitting next to Gabe Rosado, who I think is one of the coolest guys ever in boxing. And I'm above him on the ranking on the list because I'm, I'm co-main event. <laughs> and I was just someone who I massively admire. So and he was just like, oh, people talk too much. You know, he gave me some advice in the pre- when we were talking. So then I had to stand up there and speak and I was in front of all these cameras and it, it gave me such great experience and what I learned and how to behave in front of the cameras is super important. You know, like what you say and be able to deal with her being really loud, shouting at me, coming back with these comments and stuff. And I learned a lot, like my Scottish DNA definitely came to the forefront and you see that in the way in, you know, like, so we do the way in and then she's taking ages to get her shoes on. And this is something funny because in the lead up that fight week, her team had been late for everything, <laughs> literally everything. So we'd all had to wait for her the whole week, right? And then I was waiting for her again to put her shoes on so we could do the face off. I was like, do you need to put your shoes on just to be taller than me? What's going on? And then she, we had to go and I put my head in, she put her head in. We actually, and the security at the time were like, oh, is this for the cameras? And I was like, at my coach was like, no, someone needs to step in because <laughs> they're gonna have a go at each other. And that was a whole crazy situation where our teams were being kept apart in the hotel. It was just really, really different, right? So great experience. But then we get to the fight and it's probably the best shape I've ever been in my life. I was super focused at that point in my career, best shape I've ever been in, very mentally focused, super ready to go. And I, well, I lost on a 10 round points decision. And yeah, she's a much better boxer, but the whole lead up to the fight, we'd been working on trying to make her angry because I wanted her to fight me because then I had a puncher's chance. I didn't want her to use all of her Olympic skills in the lead up to the fight. <laughs> I didn't want her to do that because at that point in time, I was like not not experienced enough for that. So, and that's what we, we successfully did it. So it was great to be in the ring with someone like that. I learned a lot about my boxing skills. I've watched it back, learned loads of things, but we are still going at each other at the end of the fight, even in anti-doping, we're like rah, 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 having a go. Um, it wasn't until like six months later when we, because I got signed by her management team, Mark Taffet and her promoter, Dimitri Salita. So I was signed to Dimitri Salita after this fight. And uh, it was like six months later, we were going to be on the same card again, but in Flint, Michigan, when she was fighting Ivana Habazim. And we met each other in Florida. And the Showtime cameras were there at the Fifth Street gym. And uh, we had sparring. And Noel had already said to Mark, I'm not so sure that they've really got it out their system yet. I'm not sure they're friends. And Mark's like, oh, I'll be fine. Get there. We're both prowling along either side of the ring <laughs> before the sparring. And Mark's like, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then we had rounds like 11 to 18 or whatever. Got it all out in the ring. And she fist bumped me after and said, you got better. And from then on, we've we've just been, had a great friendship and, and started work. We had realized we've actually got quite a lot in common. We, we are very similar in the way that we think about things, about our drive for women's sport, drive for women's boxing, the success and, and all that sort of stuff. We're actually very similar, but at the time we couldn't see it in the lead up to the fight. And it made for a great, it, great watch for everybody else, you know, and it made a lot of little needle in the fight, which made the fight even better, you know? So it, it was a fantastic experience. And like I said, it just built my brand even bigger. And it was a great, a great experience in my career and one that I wouldn't change for anything. Uh, Savannah Marshall, 2020, you fought her as well for the w- WBO. Sadly, you didn't get the, the decision, but yeah. tell me about facing her. What was that like it, different to Carissa Shields, like the build up and also the fight itself? 
So Savannah and I had sparred prior to that, a couple of years, a month, half of a year before that. We'd sparred a few times before her debut and and after that. Um, And we were in the middle of the pandemic. So this fight was behind closed doors and it was in, in a bubble. So there was none of the build up like it could have been like with the face offs and things because we weren't allowed to be close to each other. There was all the, the, the COVID testing and, and hoping that we were going to make it through the 24 hours to be able to go into the fight bubble. So it was a very different atmosphere. It was very sort of clinical because there wasn't any audience. There weren't people there. And it was very strange fighting her because we could hear everything, like everything in the build up. So um, I remember it being very different because she doesn't say much and I probably spoke spoke a lot more than she did in the fight. I stepped up to middleweight again for this fight and um, it was in the pandemic and I wasn't sure I was going to have any opportunities to fight because nobody was fighting. All the boxers had no options. And then when I got offered this, I was like, I'll take it. I'll take the chance because I think I can win. And like everyone says, oh, you know, about fighters taking fights that they... That no fighter takes a fight unless they believe they can win. What is the point of taking a fight if you don't believe you're going to win? There isn't, because you're already getting in there to lose. So like when people say that, you know, oh, did you believe you could win it? Yes, I did. Yes, I did believe I was going to win that fight. But when I got there on the night, I remember looking over and thinking, gosh, she's big. <laughs> I she's remember, a tall girl, isn't she? Mm, well, we weighed in the same. But this is that thing when you weigh in the same. And the next day I stood looking opposite to her in the ring and I thought you grew, <laughs> you got bigger. Um, but you know, it was a great fight for me to to like learn a lot about myself. Like I feel like I won the first three rounds. I did on the zone cards. Like, so, you know, it was a good start of fight, but then she starts to use her physicalities. And this is one of those points when we're talking about, I'm always trying to find a way because in like round seven, I'm on the ropes. I've got a perforated eardrum and a fractured jaw. And I can't tell my lefts and rights and I'm rocking and I'm rolling and she's throwing the punches and my corner is shouting at me to take a knee. Now, my first thought is like, what the, what are they fucking talking about? I'm not taking a knee. Like I would, the thought of that, I was like, why are they asking me to take a knee? What? I've never done Like in my mind, I was like, nah, find a way out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, um, and then in the end I had to do what they said. I took the knee and then the ref called it off then. And it was for my own benefit, you know, like, if to, and my team were like, we'll fight another day. That was it. You know, just, just too big for you. And I was so angry, so angry that I was like, why do you make me take a knee? <laughs> this, this, and this. Because in my mind, I was going to find a way to make it work. Yeah. Um, but that was a good, you know, it was a different experience because it was in the bubble. And I can always look back on that and be like, this, I fought during the pandemic. And this, it was just, it was weird because we had crosses we had to stand on. We couldn't be any closer to each other. So there was no chance of getting in each other's faces at the weigh-ins. And it was a very strange, weird situation to be fighting in kind of changed the way that you looked at it. Um, but it was fantastic, you know, to fight both to bo- fight both girls. And of course, it gives me a good insight onto the fight this weekend as well. Well, this is what I'm going to come to. So your prediction with Carissa Shields and Savannah Marshall, uh, both world champion, both very, very good fighters. Both got, actually got, di- from my perspective, different styles. Very different. I would yeah. say Carissa Shields, more aggressive. I would say more active, more like a bulldog in there. Um, so Vanna Marshall has got a very slick kind of skillful style not to take anything away from Carissa Shields she's, she's skillful as well but it, you can see clearly the skill with Savannah Marshall but that's just my perspective as a fan you as a pro boxer from a world champion you tell me what, what's, what's the pros and cons with them and who do you think has got the ultimate advantage personally I feel and I have always said this um, Carissa wins this fight for me and that's because I think her ring IQ is vastly underestimated. And the fact that her use of distance and timing in the ring, like people think she's very flat footed. There's always commenting on how flat footed she is, but she covers the distance really well. And she cuts the ring off well. She gets herself into positions to execute what she needs to do. And, and like I said, her ring IQ is very clever. And you see that in, in the fights with um, like Christina Hamer, for example. Christina's got a world-class jab. Her jab is like Klitschko jab, you know, it's great. It's a weapon in itself. And, you know, Carissa, after the first round, she starts to take that jab away and then she doesn't have that jab. So then she starts to be able to do all of the stuff that that Carissa needs to do to win the fight and get on top of her. So 
she's very clever. She's got a great boxing mind. And I always say that she, one day she's going to be a formidable coach. Like, I think she's going to have some of her own world champions. <laughs> um, but for me, I just think her experience at world level, she, you know, she's a multiple weight world champion now, unified in three weight classes, um, plus a two times gold Olympian. I, I just think... IQ wise, she's got a bit more. Now, Savannah has the added power. She has the punch power. Absolutely. She's a, she's a big hitter, you know, and in women's boxing, that's not that common, you know, like to have the actual power in your shots. When you put it together, you finally get it in. Yes. But you know, she's just got that sort of big punch power and long levers. She's very rangy. She's really, like you said, completely different style to Clarissa. You know, she's long. She, she's much more flowy. Um, Clarissa, you know, she puts punches in bunches, combinations, fast things. Whereas Savannah is a bit more, relaxed and fluid and uh, like you said two different styles and that's what makes it a great fight because it's kind of like boxer versus puncher in that regard so i think the first half of the fight i anticipate carissa being ahead it's the second half of the fight we might see like maybe savannah start to get her range a little bit more and land some of those big heavy punches and of course we're not going to want to see carissa sitting at the end of those because that's where the damage is done um so it is a great fight and it's a real 50 50 I just, I'm going with Carissa and before anyone says it, it's not because we're friends and I'm not, I'm not biased. It's actually my general boxing opinion on that front. Well, I, you've just uh, anticipated my next question. You, you answered it from uh, who do you think is going to win? Yeah. Who would you like to win? I'd like Carissa to win this one because she's been wanting this fight for a really long time. And that's not because I'm not pro-British fighters or anything like this. Um, I, she's been asking for this fight with Savannah for a really long time. And she's, you know, it's the big fight in her division. And it's been pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And now she finally gets a chance. And I think as well, like with Clarissa, is that she's a real talent and you need to have that dance partner. And, and Savannah's her dance partner. It's got the whole history thing about the, the fight when they were amateurs. Um, and everything else. It's just like, you need that one person in boxing. You know, you look at some of the greats. <laughs> um, so like they've all had that dance partner. And I think she's been wanting this for a long time. And it's a big, massive stage headlining the O2 on Sky Sports. It's a real chance to kind of get out there. So I, I'd, I'd love her to win it because I think she deserves the opportunity to get out there and really put her name firmly in the history books. We um, spoke about off camera um, about the paradox between, you know, being a athlete and having a profile, but then also being true to yourself. Yeah. Um, Ahara Davis, mm -hmm. he's been on my podcast twice. Yep. And we spoke about this at length mm -hmm. uh, actually a few weeks ago. And I admire uh, Ahara Davis. Some of the stuff he's come out with is quite wild, <laughs> uh, but I think he admits that as well. But I admire because he's been him. Mm -hmm. And he says that. He said, I could get more endorsement deals. I could have more money. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I haven't is because I am outspoken and agencies or brands are a little bit worried working with me because I might say something that's not true to their own brand, which, yeah. which he gets. But he says, I'd rather have to be true to myself rather than the money. That's more important to me. So without going into it too much, I mean, like the paradox between who you are as an individual, but yeah. who the media or the sporting world of boxing want you to be, that must be a bit hard balance to kind of get right. Yeah, but then like I'm with a horror in this, you only fundamentally be yourself. And it's like whenever I do commentary, for example, with anything, I always will speak the truth uh, about who I think won the fight and things like that. You know, it's, it's I think it's, it's important to be honest in these situations because I'm a current fighter myself. I wouldn't want someone sitting there saying I'd won a fight when I lost it. I think that was just sort of, you know, you, you can't justify that. And it, like, it looks bad on you as the person as well as the fighter, because you're currently within the situation now and then. So, you know, um, if you're going to say something, be honest about it. But then equally, it is important to manage your brand and your profile, because like you said, working with companies, endorsement deals, they don't want you off there swearing left, right and center on what you're tweeting about. And, you know, having really sort of bizarre sh shout outs about things which can sometimes look bad on their product. So it is a really fine balancing act, 
but at the end of the day it's a business and and you are a business but you are a person as well so you've got to have your own personal opinions on things you just have to think carefully about when you say them and why you're saying them you know is it is it just because you're ranting or just sounding off or is it because you genuinely feel fully strongly and passionately about that topic so you you actually feel that you want to say something about it so it, it you've got to be clever and you've got to think carefully about it but there's also that difficult side of things where it, some people are just too PR'd. You know, the stuff they come out with, you're just like, you don't really believe that. Or like when people use their social media and somebody else posts for them. It's like, that's not really the person you are. Um, and you can see right through it. So I think with social media today, it's a, a whole other minefield for boxers to be aware of. And I think they, you do need to learn about it. You need to learn about how to post, how to promote yourself, because it's a great platform to promote yourself and, and get people to follow you. But then, you know, you've got to be careful about how you do it, when you post, what you post. So it is a minefield. And I do say to young fighters, the most important thing when you, if you want to be somebody in the sport, you've got to learn to how to actually have a conversation in front of a camera yeah, and, and talk to media and be able to talk to people in general, because people want to know you as a person. They want to know about you and a little bit about, you know, the public love to know about you, like, so they can be part of your journey. Like they fully are part of your journey as a person. So I think it's important to be yourself because then people can get behind you. Because like even me asking you the question of Carissa Shield versus Savannah, who do you think is going to win? And then who do you want to win? And yeah. someone can perceive that a fan yeah. or a boxing follower online can perceive that any way they want. And you, we could see a tweet. They could turn that convers- this conversation into a tweet mm-hmm. and they don't, they don't hear the tone. They don't hear where you come from. They don't see no. all the content. They just see that statement and they go... You know, Hannah Rankin, she's a hater. She's yeah. a hater and she's against all British people and, yeah. and they can start attacking you. I do want to ask you another question that could be perceived as a little bit controversial, but I'm just airing it because it came out recently. And I've got a view on it, but I want to get your view on it. Sadly, we didn't see Chris Eubank Connor Jr. Ben. against Conor Ben. Yep. And we all know what's happened mm-hmm. is there's been substances found in Conor Ben's, I think, blood or urine. Yep which actually wasn't an anabolic steroid, but I think it was a female hormone, which this is my understanding and learning of it, looks like he used it to counter some kind of steroid to either hide it or balance out the, the hormones yeah, or testosterone th- I think in the that's body. Basically what it is. So it's basically not an illegal substance, but it's a substance that will... Sh- it's almost- on the ban list because it's for masking oh, right. other things. Okay, so, yeah. so it's a masker, okay? Yeah. Um, like, what is your take as a pro boxer or, or, or on this? I mean, one, do you think he did take something, or do you think he's 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 uh, you know he's he's he intentionally done something wrong? And is boxing being regulated enough with this sort of stuff? First and foremost, always innocent until proven guilty. And um, you know, there is a B sample that needs to be tested. There is things that need to be looked into. So I'm not gonna sit here and say that he is guilty or he isn't because that hasn't fully come out. The information will come out soon with the the um, anti-doping things and with VADA, with uh, UCAD and how it's investigated, that will be looked into. So, you know, I, I'm never gonna sit there because this can, this can ruin someone's career. Like, you know, at the end of the day and I would never, I never want to pass aspersions on anybody like that. But I do feel that the, there is problems with the fact that it was announced two days prior to the actual fight when they knew about it nearly two weeks prior to the fight. So there is somebody at fault there. <laughs> that should have been announced well before. And I've got quite strong opinion on this. Like a lot of people are like, oh, the fight should have just gone ahead anyway. He was the smaller fighter. It doesn't matter. And I was like, my last, not the last fight with Terry, but the fight before that with Alejandra, my opponent went to hospital and was put in an induced coma. You know, she needed to have some operations. And, you know, boxing is a dangerous sport. It's not like cycling or running. Like it's not the same. You're, you're actually impacting on each other. Like you actually hit each other. So there is risk of injury and fatalities anyway even in the sport which we god forbid that we hope doesn't happen but you know what with the situation with my last po- my opponent um you know automatically i was like well if that has been found to be the case this fight cannot go ahead 
because God forbid something happened to Eubank in that fight. How can you justify it? it? The fight went ahead because of the vast amount of money concerned. Like money should never come over the safety of fighters. Like it just should never. And it's a very, unfortunately, it's like a completely, it's a dark day for for boxing because the fact that there were ways people were trying to make this fight happen, even though it wasn't confirmed either way, whether it was or it wasn't, you, you you can't you can't do that. It's running the risk of sa- fighter safety. Um, and I think some people try to justify it because he's the smaller fighter. So like you know, and Eubank was coming down to the way and he was coming up, so it wouldn't be a problem. But yeah, you you never know. And as soon as someone's a fighter's health comes into the situation, there should be no questions asked. Should be called off. Things should be looked into, and then we go from there. As, as a fan, and it's a very selfish point of view, I'm one of those people that was like in the back of my mind. I hope it happens. Try Again, yeah. the boxer's mindset, which is there's a problem. Now I just try and work out the problem, even if I've got no influence over it. But in my head, I was like, well, yeah, he is a smaller fighter. And yeah, I mean, how much of a difference is it really going to make? And Chris yeah. Eubank's probably going to win anyway, etc. So there was a selfish point of view because from an entertaining point of view, yeah. all the fans wanted to see it. It was geared to be this Epic. Chris Eubank, um, Ben, uh, fur fight, even though it was their sons. And everyone was looking forward to it. It was going to be probably the biggest Brit- British boxing fight ever in history. But then the logical side comes in, which is if the fight took place... Yep. And Conor Ben landed a big right, and he's he's a very ferocious and a dangerous fighter and powerful, and he's not knocks out Chris Eubank, and Chris Eubank then dies because of that, or has all, a life threatening injury. Yeah, you know, like all the fans, including me, would have turned around and said, "Shit, I actually supported this to happen, and now now he's died." And then what happens? Who goes to prison? Does does Conor Ben go to prison? Does Eddie Hearn go? Like what happens? But your view, so if someone has taken a substance that is illegal and they are found to be guilty, and we don't know if that's the case mm-hmm. yet, but let's just say hypothetically, where do you stand with them as a fighter? Should they be banned for life or should they get another shot? Personally, I can't, I, in my mind, I cannot justify cheating. I don't understand how you can sit there as a human being with yourself day in, day out and know that your successes have come from you cheating the system. I don't understand that. Like it does not compute in my mind. You, If I am going to become world champion and I have these, um, this amazing career and do all of these things, I want to do it fairly. Like I'm not going to cheat my way to that situation. I, and I don't know if that's just because that's my character, but I, I would have thought most people don't want to, don't want to do something by cheating. So I, I, that is one problem. I don't know how you live with yourself <laughs> because effectively your success is all manufactured by by cheating. But then secondly, some like we said, somebody could have died. Somebody could have had life-threatening, like, you know, career-ending injuries. And, you know, that stops their career. That stops their, like, they're not earning anything, not doing anything. So, you know, it's, you're taking someone else's life in your hands and you knowingly did that. And it's not, it's it's not like I took something to run faster than the person next to me, or I took something to to be stronger to throw the weights to pick the weights up better. Like you took something which made you stronger, more explosive, more powerful, and therefore you could inflict more injury and pain onto your opponent and damage. Like so, that fundamentally is wrong. So therefore, for me, it's a, a lifetime ban. Like, uh, even though as much as I love. Canelo Alvarez and he's, he's incredible you know and he's probably the most high profile boxer I think on the planet at the moment give or take maybe a few, few others as well I mean wasn't he done for a banned substance and probably because of the amount of money he brings in he's kind of welcomed back within a few months the thing with Canelo is he also had that in Mexico it's a well known like they use clenbuterol in, in all of the meat there to make it leaner and a lot of other sports people from different sports so like it is found in footballers it's found in in lots of them because that's part of it there the the problem there is that Canelo has the money to not have not intake that meat so you know it's like but he had he had his excuse which was then upheld and plausible um I I don't say don't tell me I'm not saying that's right um but he's not the only one in his, his like He's not the only one in his country in sport to be affected by that uh, 
Whereas this is a product that you had to knowingly take. It's not something you can accidentally take as far as I know. Um, so yeah. Hannah, I know a lot of boxers because I box and I've been in and around boxing since I'm 14 years of age and I'm never going to mention any names because it would be highly un unprofessional of me mm -hmm. and I just wouldn't do it. Uh, but I've spoken to professional uh, boxers and they're saying, listen, mate, this whole thing about Conor Ben, mm -hmm. this is the, it's only been highlighted because it's a high-profile fight. This mm -hmm. happens a lot in, in boxing and it's, it's been done behind the scenes yeah. and they're so clever, some of these boxers, they know how to combat and mask what they're doing. Yeah. How much truth is in that, do you think? I don't know. I like For me, I know nothing about that side of it. And that's probably it's because I'm not involved in it, but you know, and maybe more for me for being a little bit more naive about it. I, I would like to think there's less of it happening than people are saying, or I like to think none of it's happening, but because of this situation, it has put a highlight on a certain on a certain aspect of it and it you know things are being brought to light and i think in some ways this is probably good because what is the point like and this is my main issue with it what is the point in paying for vada an independent anti-doping company you pay to have that right and then you you're going to disregard what they're saying like because you can't pass them what well, was the point? It says it's not like it's an independent anti-doping company that we don't pay for. Fighters pay for that, you know. Like the promoters pay for that, and you know, it's that it's, they've raised a the flag and said this has been found here. What you're just going to choose to ignore them? Why? Because it's the, one of the most largest grossing payment. Com like you know, do you know what I mean? It's just mm. that in itself is mad. So it just. I think this has probably sh shone a light on a few situ like things in the boxing world, which probably people didn't want the light shone on. But it's a, it's a dirty side of the sport. You, you don't want to know. Like you look at things like you know Lance Armstrong and stuff like that. Like that all came out. That was that was big <laughs> when that came out. And he was a hero to to many, a hero. So many, so many. And then what he did came out, and he just he lost it all. It's like why would you do that? Why would you not try and compete? So, and other people argue and say, oh, well, I know other people are doing it, so it's not fair, so I might as well do it as well. I'm like, that in itself, I can't justify that. I don't know how you sleep with yourself at night. Mm. That's how I see it. But yeah, it's not something that I'm aware of or know of anybody doing, but you yeah. know. Um, so when it, women's boxing, um, Right now, it sounds it seems like it's booming. It wasn't always booming because it was almost a bit suppressed. You know, we yeah. were talking about this earlier. Uh, where do you see it going over the next five or ten years, and what part are you going to play in that? Well, I'm absolutely buzzing to see where women's boxing is right now, and I'm actually really proud to be, uh, you know, currently a former world champion, but soon to be three times world champion, um, at the forefront of that, you know, and it's an amazing time to be at the forefront of the change. Like, you know, it's, it's when I look back, when I'm a lot older, I'm sitting in a rocking chair, wherever I'll be like, I was at the forefront of that moment when it was changing for women's sport in boxing, you know, in mm -hmm. our sport. So very, very proud, incredibly proud to be part of it. Um, and I just think in five years time, we're just going to see even more. And I think it's going to, instead it's not going to be women's boxing, it's just going to be boxing. And we're going to have like a mixed cards. And like nowadays, we've even seen most cards will have a female fight on it. So that's a real step forward from before when it was just like, when I used to be at York Hall, and when I was just right at the very beginning of my career, oh, it's the chicks fight, we'll go to the bar. <laughs> when it was like, that's the only chicks fight I'd seen in maybe like six months. <laughs> and everyone was like, oh, it's the chicks fight, we'll go to the bar. But now like the caliber of fighter you've got coming out of like the Olympic teams and, you know, more girls wanting to get involved in the sport and actually, you know, we're just seeing some amazing fights and women never disappoint. We always lay it all out on the line. It's exciting. It's fast paced. It's competitive. There's no taking your time to have a look we're getting it done you know and and the thing with women's boxing is the best fight the best so much more regularly it's like the ufc so that's what makes it great for fans because you know your top level fighters are fighting top level fighters sometimes in the guys i think they get away with kind of avoiding each other a little bit um and like the best fights don't happen always when they should but in women's boxing they happen and they come around a lot quicker and we see a lot a lot of fluctuation and change all the time in the women's game. You don't see a, a champion sitting there with the belts forever because there's always somebody coming up young, hungry, wants that position. And even if you take a loss in your career in women's boxing, you're always fighting to get back on the ladder because then you get the shot again and you get the next shot and then you're on a big stage and you're fighting for that world title. So 
I think it's it's slightly different to the guys, but it's it's fast paced and it's exciting. Well, to see you know your pro debut in May two thousand and seventeen to where you are now, you know being two time world champion and yeah. obviously going to be a third shortly. I mean, it's it, it's almost like everything's been really really fast tracked. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's great to see, you know, you want to be in high profile fights, them learning fights and things are going to build up your own brand. So to conclude this podcast, where, what is the next chapter for you? Have you got any fights lined up? And the other thing I like to ask fighters, even though you're young and you're still determined to make a mark in the sport and, and do your thing, there must be thoughts and ideas beyond the sport of boxing. Like where are you, what are you going to do? What What's life going to you know hold for you have you got any business ideas any plans okay so um i'm looking to fight again in the beginning of next year i've got a comeback fight so i'm looking around about hopefully march time is when i'm looking to be out again um and then i'll be working my way back towards where i belong as a world champion um that's the goal that's what the team are working towards that's where i truly believe that i belong so that's what i'm working at no guaranteed fights set up or anything done just yet so can't give you any information on that because i don't know <laughs> um but you know I'm in a very exciting division right now. There's a lot of big fights out there, the super welterweight division. And like I said, I'm very happy to drop down to welterweight too. So to be a two-weight world champion, that'd be amazing. Um, for myself, uh, future plans. I think it's really important as a fighter to think about that because, you know, like I said, it's not a long-lived career. You can't box into your 50s. Well, you shouldn't be boxing into 50s in my personal opinion. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's that. And then you need to make sure that you've got a life after boxing. I mean, I'm really blessed obviously with my music career that that is always there for me, but I've got into this commentary side of things, which I'm really enjoying um, way earlier than I ever expected to get a chance to do it. So I think for me, it's an area that I didn't think that I'd love as much as I do, but I really enjoy it. I'm very passionate about it. I get to be a total geek, go and research all the fighters, sit there, have the best seat in the house, talk about what I love. So yeah, I think that's an area I'd like to pursue a little bit more, um, a little bit more television work. That's something, and that's some, again, having had a lot of performance anxiety when I was younger, the thought of doing that now is just to me mad, but it's really exciting. Um, I do a lot of work with the BoxWise charity, um, we took the the charity from the UK. We took it all the way over to South Africa, set it up there. It's just started in Uganda. We're going to be hitting Brazil next year. So that's all in the pipeline for something that I want to maintain my kind of connections with. And I think just use my sort of what, what I've learned in the boxing world. I don't think I'll ever not be involved in boxing because I love it so much and it's taken kind of hold of me. And I think anybody that kind of gets involved in boxing, they can never really leave it alone. So that's I do see boxing in my future just whether or not it's uh, on the mic or doing some television based stuff or p helping with promotions helping with uh, management I don't know but I, I definitely want to be involved in, in the sport it's good stuff right this is the last question so when I um, when I started my first brand when I was younger mm -hmm. 24 years of age I come up with a, a, a catchphrase or a saying a mantra it goes like this be happy never contempt yeah. Now I've got my own interpretation. I know what that means to me and what I try and live by every single day. But if I were to ask the first female world champion from Scotland, Hannah Rankin, what does be happy, never content mean to you? I think to be happy is to love what you do and appreciate appreciate all the little things in life, the people around you, um, where you are, what you're doing, be in the moment, that's to be happy. But to be never content is to always want to strive to be that little bit better, to strive to push yourself to get to that next level, to compete with yourself, to see how far you can go. That's what to never be content is. Perfect answer. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a really, really good conversation. No, I really and enjoyed I it. Look forward to seeing your... Uh, your 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 brand grow your career manifest into something great and uh, which it has been already and uh yeah looking forward to seeing you on tv and comment uh, doing the commentating so thank you very much and i hope you enjoyed this episode thank you very much thank you